Hello friends. Today in the Carpenter Shop, we have a big treat for you. Joining me today is an award-winning American sacred artist, Gwyneth Thompson Briggs. After pursuing advanced degrees in engineering and physics, Gwyneth, a mother of four, launched her art studio with her husband, Andrew, in St. Louis in 2019 as her full-time family business. Steeped in the traditional Renaissance and Spanish Baroque styles, her art adorns churches, schools, and homes worldwide, including one that was presented to Pope Benedict XVI years ago. A passion for promoting sacred art among young Christian artists and co-founder of the Catholic Artist Directory, Gwyneth sees art as part of the church's mission to evangelize. You can glimpse some of her heavenly artwork at GwynethThompsonBriggs.com. Without further ado, it is my delight to welcome you, Gwyneth, to our humble little carpenter shop for a cup of joe. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So Gwyneth, please tell us a bit about yourself, how you became such an amazing artist, and as we like to ask all of our guests, how do you like your cup of joe? Well, I'll start with the, the easiest question first. I like my coffee strong, and uh, every morning I usually have uh, either an espresso or an espresso with steamed milk, and those are the only options right now. Um, but uh, but yeah, the only reason I am a sacred artist right now is the grace of God. Um, for my whole life, I, I was called to the arts, but I didn't really feel like I could paint uh, as well as I oh, as well as I wanted to. Um, and it was only in time that God uh, allowed me to find the training that I needed. And then after that sort of, um, gave uh, my husband and I the the situation where we kind of had to figure out what to do to provide for our family. And um, having a family sacred art business was um, sort of an obvious opportunity. And um, uh, when we went for it, there was a moment of indecision where St. Joseph really came through for us. Um, so we know we're on the right track. But uh, now in retrospect, I'm even more grateful because it's only through, you know, years of practice that um, one gets to really develop one's craft. And I can say now, you know, after thousands of hours painting, I'm still every day finding new secrets kind of being unlocked as far as technique or ideas <laughs> on how to approach different subjects. Well, that is awesome. Well, I, I know we were talking just before the show, how isn't it interesting how some of the things that might appear to be like accidents uh, happen where, you know, in hindsight, we see that God's hand was right there very providentially. And I understand that he kind of forced you into this position because you maybe didn't have enough courage to do it yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I had thought, oh, how nice it would be if that could be our family business. We could just homeschool the kids in the morning and then um, I could paint, my husband could write and um, how nice that would be. So I interviewed a few professional artists and they said, don't do it, it's too risky. Um, but we still said, well, let's just try it a couple of months. And now here we are five years later, um, still going strong. So um, God can do anything, including um, making an art career possible. And now I've actually found that there's so much demand that I spend a lot of time encouraging young people to take it really seriously if they feel that they might have a vocation to the arts. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, I put a couple of pictures here in our little carpenter shop. Um, I love how these two pictures show you, you know, with the family doing your work. And uh, which one of your children is inside your tummy there when you're doing that beautiful masterpiece? Um, that one is my youngest. So Ferdinand. Yeah, it was funny. Oh. I, I found out I was expecting him and uh, just right at the beginning of this very large project. And then um, I remember after I finished these three massive paintings, I rolled them up and checked them. They were all packaged and he arrived the next day. So oh, wow. um, I was very grateful for his <laughs> wow. ability to sort of roll with uh, the, the demands of, of deadlines. Well, I think there's something quite mystical there where you're like somehow bringing life onto the canvas somehow with life within you kicking. That's just, uh, I don't know how to put it into words, but it's so cool. 
And what about this picture on the right here? What's going on there? Uh, it looks like you and maybe a, a, a Joseph-like man behind the scenes there. <laughs> Yes, that's that's my husband and I. That was another really important moment in our lives. Um, and, and this is actually at the service of a work of art that I did not create. Um, this is um, at the statue of St. Louis uh, in Forest Park, St. Louis. Um, mm -hmm. There was a threat of knocking this statue down during that summer of um, 2020 when everything was so tumultuous. And so... Uh, my husband gathered a group of men to start to say the rosary uh, in the interest of preserving the statue. Things kind of were coming to a head, and fortunately, um, hundreds of people turned out to say the rosary, and that statue is still standing there today. Um, and in fact, over the last month and a half, we've been um, saying the rosary at the statue every day um, in petition to Our Lady um, to defeat their um, a political amendment three here in St. Louis that seeks to codify uh, abortion in the in the state constitution. So we're um, seeking Our Lady's help to um, to fight that, and at the same time, the continued preservation of the statue. You know, this work of art um, continues to do so much good in inspiring the the, the true spirit of Christendom. Well, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you to your husband, Andrew, for getting a bunch of people together. I mean, in a way, he saved St. Louis's main iconic statue. So as myself, who's from St. Louis, I want to say thank you, Andrew, for doing that. That is so awesome. And I can only imagine that not only St. Joseph, but you also have St. Louis in your corner now batting for you. So I think good things are going to happen there. So thank you so much well, for yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, and there are just so many inspiring people that are so faithful um, you know, many times I can't make it, but there are a, a handful of very quiet, humble people that just show up every day and they, it, it's such an inspiration. That is so cool. That is so cool. And you're in St. Louis. I grew up in St. Louis and well, North County and Florissant and in South County and also out in Baldwin. Um, and I think you guys are in South County, judging on the windows that I can see here in your studio. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. No, th this this paint this this picture is actually from um, New Hampshire. So, oh. wow. Okay, <laughs> it, it looks kind of yeah, like South right. County with those windows there. It looks uh, you know, like a house that I grew up in. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of gracious uh, buildings out here. That's true. That is awesome. Well, with your permission, I'd like to go inside your studio if the uh, magic of technology works. So I'm gonna, in a snap of a finger here, here we are, so now we're in your gallery. And uh, can you just tell me a little bit about what's going on with those paintings behind you? Um, these particular paintings um, I completed um, about mm, uh, eight years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago. Um, this was a real turning point in my formation where I had the opportunity to make uh, copies of paintings in the Museum of Fine Arts collection in Boston. And um, so here you can see paintings by um, several of my favorite artists, including John Singer Sargent and Velasquez. And the technique that they use to paint is not one that is commonly taught nowadays, but it's very challenging and very beautiful. So I think the only way to really um, start to understand how they painted is to try to make copies from life and look really closely to see how did their hand move over the canvas and kind of push the paint around. That is awesome. Well, uh, let me add a couple of other paintings here, if you don't mind. Uh, so we'll look at some other uh, paintings that you have in your gallery. Um, so with these in the background, uh, there for the viewers. Let me ask you the next question, which is kind of like uh, uh, an artsy question, but I, I saw on an EWT an article where you were quoted as saying, quote, I think in sacred art today, there's sometimes the danger of a saint looking like they were copied from a photograph. And it can also tend to desacralize the saint. And on your website, uh, which I think that you and Andrew did a magnificent job. And I want to tell everyone to go to your website just to see some of the writings there because it's kind of like a nice little uh, um, devotion besides the fantastic art. Uh, but on your website, I saw that you said uh, that you eschew the, quote, soft and effeminate depictions of Joseph with the glowing prettiness of a porcelain doll. So all I can say to that is amen. 
And can you please unpack this rather pregnant topic for us? And along the way, what is art and how and who are some of your favorite artists who have inspired you? Well, gosh, that was a lot of questions. Where do I start? <laughs> Um, hmm. Well, what is art? Um, I would say that art is the attractive power of truth. Uh, you know, I think art leads us to God and, and um, it cannot be divorced from beauty, which makes everything so confused today. Um, we think that art is more about self-expression when really it should not be about the self at all. I think that art should really be about glimpsing this um, hint of a beauty that is to come so the beauty that is emanating from heaven and um, with that little foretaste that gives us the encouragement um, to have hope and to uh, keep moving forward in the spiritual life um, as far as the um, kind of problem today of how sacred figures are represented, I think that technology plays a significant role because um, historically, you know, we could not lean on images that we found on the internet. We couldn't use AI. Everything had to be done the hard way, which is painting from um, either pure imagination or um, a model sitting in front of you or a combination of the two. And that is what I try to do in my practice. I always try to work from life whenever possible. So that means that I bring in models and I sew costumes and have real props because there is such um, beauty and subtlety when it comes to the play of light on physical materials that um, a camera cannot capture. Only the human eye can capture it because it requires the element of time. So if you think about um, painting a, a portrait of someone you know really well, um, you'll know that there are certain gestures or certain angles that they tend to make whenever they speak. And if you say, ah, oh, I'm going to depict that gesture that they made right there, you can see that that's going to be a much more true portrait than if, um, it was just a snapshot that's just a moment in time. Um, so the same thing I think is true uh, with sacred art. You need that element of time to really um, look not just at this model that you put together, but you need to sort of read the life of the scene to maybe bring in um, additional models to sort of say, well, those eyes are very kindly, but we need hands that are maybe a little bit more elegant and you can sort of build from all these earthly hints what this heavenly portrait could look like. Um, but uh, I would encourage all artists to resist that temptation to do anything easy. Um, and um, I have a there's I have a lot of very strong concerns about AI and especially AI sacred art. But we can yeah. talk about that later if you want. Well, that's that's really profound. I mean, there's kind of like what I would maybe call a whole sacramentality of art where you're kind of incarnating things in a way. Um, I should just stop now because I don't really know what I'm talking about. But um, I mean, it's, yeah, AI, it's 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 very different. It's and not incarnational because it exists as a digital image. You know, there's no materiality. And I think a really big thing is that God can work through maybe some of our are blundering forward our mistakes and so often when I'm painting um you know I'll make little errors here and there and um God works through that and he says well you weren't anticipating to do that but look at how beautiful why don't you keep that mistake and then I will um make it even more glorious and I think it's um very similar to what he does in the spiritual life um as we uh, make our our daily mistakes and yet try to um God can always draw that good from 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 error. Absolutely. It's like, oh, happy fault. And I love what you said about how art is the attractive power of truth. And I love this uh, artwork you did of the one who is the truth, the way in the life. And um, we're about to go talk about his loving earthly foster father. Uh, but before we do, let me just change these pictures one more time. 
And um, I understand that one on the left uh, was given to a famous person. That's right. That's a, for that was a, a watercolor for Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth, and um, you know I had a very short time frame in which to make this little watercolor, but um, I was very nervous and just kept trying to not think about who the painting was for. <laughs> um, a priest I knew was going to be visiting the Pope and wanted to just give him a little token of something i'm i'm pretty sure he put it in the closet as soon as he got it he said thank you very graciously who knows what happened to it but um it was really nice to be able to say thank you in a way because i know that benedict the 16th was quite instrumental in my my husband's kind of reversion oh. um which i'm so grateful for um wow. yeah well, i, I have, made the painting very personal i have a sneaky feeling that uh Benedict the 16th is watching right now and he's probably smiling he's probably saying I like that image yeah well if he if he doesn't have anything better to do right now I guess he can watch it <laughs> and also I love the one in the middle there um I think that's the patron of your parish maybe um St. Francis de Sales yeah um yes that was a really a, a delight to do um there was a very kind seminarian locally who happened to have that wonderful um, both hair and beard combination that's so um, uh, uh, common in these depictions of Francis de Sales. And, you know, we can't really see it here, but if you were to zoom in very closely, you'll see that Francis de Sales is holding a book. And on that book, which is supposed to be the introduction to the devout life, um, there's a little honeybee on the page. Ah. And, um, this is in reference to his his quote about how it's um it's easier to draw souls with um a spoonful of honey than a barrel of vinegar and um uh yeah it's it's so much fun to sort of hide some of these details that kind of only become revealed as you take the time to really look at a painting yeah i think this image of saint francis de sales is now my favorite and uh I'm sorry. I think it might be a venial sin here that I showed it so small. I just want to encourage everyone to go to your website right now and look at it because the detail is so amazing. Like that page, the, the page looks so real. Um, it, it's just amazing. And, and, and I love I love that quote, too, uh, only because I'm normally the one that gives too much vinegar and I need to give more honey. Um, <laughs> it might be because of my former uh, Baptist ways. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm trying to improve on the honey part. So, uh, all right, so now, without further ado, let me get into some of the uh, main images that I know all of our viewers want to look at. Uh, so these are three that you've done on St. Joseph, you know, the greatest uh, saint after Our Lady. Um, so the one there, of course, on the right is the one that I'd like to zoom in on first. So if you don't mind, I'll kind of take us back to our carpenter shop so we can get a little bit of a uh, closer zoom in image uh, on this one. And if you could um, just, you know, let us know how this wonderful painting came to be. And um, yeah, what 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 is your favorite part of this awesome artwork? Well, this was um, one of the first works of art that I was doing as we were trying to discern whether painting should be our family business or not. And so this painting I created as a gift for um uh, uh, an order of nuns and I asked my older brother to model for me so this actually looks very much like my older brother and I thought he did such a wonderful job of sort of exemplifying um, the virtues of Saint Joseph as this hard-working um, laborer and provider and uh, uh, it makes me happy to, to look at it even today and actually the tunic that that St. Joseph is wearing had been his um, Halloween costume when he was a crusader as a little boy. So all of the elements kind of um, are funny as they come together. One of the strangest things about this painting though, is that after it was given to the nuns and they sent out um, like a newsletter with the image on it, someone wrote in and they said, um, how did you make the lily look like um 
a hand saying, I love you. And I think that there was someone whose brother was deaf. Anyway, they noticed that if you look at the lily, I'll hold up my fingers like this. Um, this is how you say, um, I love you in sign language. And mm -hmm. so if you kind of, let's see, I'm not sure if I have the angle right, but can you kind of see yeah. how it almost looks like that hand? Wow. And, um, so that was something so beautiful that I had not intended to include, um, but that somehow appeared in the painting. That That is what I think we call a signal grace right there. I think it's like St. Joseph saying, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like one of your first paintings? Uh, yeah, one of the my first paintings as far as um, trying to great paintings formally for our for our business. I had been, you know, painting for a long time, but just, um, you know, here and there at a much smaller scale. Wow. Well, I, I love this. And, you know, it's funny, the, um, the order of sisters that you mentioned, um, in my little book, The Journey with Joseph on page 105, uh, I have an image there, which is called The Three Hearts, uh, that they gave me permission to put in the book. Um, and uh, yeah, so we probably know some of the same people there at the Monastery of St. Joseph uh, with yes. the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. So that's it's such a small world. And um, in this picture, I mean, well, not picture, in this art, uh, I love how you have Joseph depicted so naturally in that, uh, and I probably am mispronouncing this, but in the Cairo Scuro style of art that brings Joseph, like, you know, like Joseph the Silent out of the shadows, as it were, uh, and into the into the light, kind of almost in like a alchemical way, if I could say that. And, and I think that Caravaggio would give this a big thumbs up. Oh, good. <laughs> the, uh, and, and there's a book by Mike Aquilina called St. Joseph and His World, where he actually talks about this artistic method of Cairo Scuro. So can you talk a little bit about like, what is that and how, uh, to me, it's kind of really profoundly interesting, like how that style of art is so like St. Joseph. Yes, I, I, it's one of my very favorites, this idea of sort of um, losing a lot of information into the shadows. And what happens is that, you know, as far as painting goes, there's many details that are not communicated with the brush. But if you do it correctly, then you are able to bring the eye just to a few areas where the light is pointing. So in this case, you know, I've highlighted the the lily, St. Joseph's face, and also his tools as most the most important parts. But um, the rest of the areas are left to the imagination. So if the viewer sees some of the details, then they can sort of fill in everything else that's shrouded in mystery. And that's why I think that this particular style of painting can be really suited towards um, contemplation um, because the artist is just providing a little bit and then it is your your own meditation that takes care of the rest. Yeah, I, I love how he's standing there, like, you know, holding that lily as if it were like a sword, kind of standing tall like a knight. And I noticed that, you know, it has the light there on his ear, which to me makes me think about, you know, like the word obedient means to like listen to God. And, you know, St. Joseph the Silent listen to God like better than anybody. Uh, and so the lights on his ear, I noticed more than his face, which also kind of to me kind of signals like his humility. So I think, um, I don't know, that's what I see, but I, I, there's like so much going on in this awesome art. Um, yeah, I just love it. It's one of my favorite images of St. Joseph. I'm so glad. And yeah, as you know, I just, I always do my best, but then there are so many elements that I was not intending, but um, people are able to perceive. And I'm so grateful when they bring those to my attention because then I say, wow, God was really kind of, uh, taking care of a lot of the the other elements that um, I, I wasn't even being truly mindful of in that moment. That's so cool. That's so cool. And, you know, I, I think it's really interesting that um, here on the Cup of Joe show, uh, our very first guest was also an artist. So, Gwyneth, you are the second artist that we've ever had on the show. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Our, our first artist was Cecilia Lawrence, a.k.a. Theophilia. Um, so since you're the second one, it made me think, well, maybe something else is getting ready to start. So when we started this little channel called Josephology, uh, she was our first guest. And uh, now there's another group that we're starting called the Josephology Society. So I'd like to invite all of our guests to 
Uh, please stay tuned to the end. So we'll have a special announcement about this. So I'll keep you in suspense. Uh, by the way, this is another uh, Spanish artist you probably are a fan of, uh, Murillo. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's so cool. I mean, uh, artwork is so amazing, such a great way to evangelize. And with that said, let me take us to the second image here of St. Joseph. So on this one, um, you know, and it's so fitting here, we're in the carpenter shop. So tell us a little bit about this, like how did it came about? And also, what spiritual significance would you see in the tools there that we can see? You know, the, the saw, the hammer, and then that, that plane. Um, well, this uh, painting was commissioned for a parish in um, Florida. And um, the kind of technical challenge here was to create um, this, this tondo, so it's sort of a round composition. And um, I've always been intrigued by the depiction of the Christ child, um, but still sort of being mindful of the suffering that is to come. And so here you can see that the Christ child is, is his arms are outstretched as if he is on the cross. And yet St. Joseph is around him sort of trying to, to guard from him from, from any um, pain or injury while he is in his care. Uh, the halos are gold leaf, and I also used a little bit of gold to highlight some of the rivets on the saw and some other elements within the um, the tools. Um, in order to be most the most convincing I could, um, I did get a real leather apron, and I borrowed actual tools. Um, some people might object and say, well, I don't think that... St. Joseph was using a craftsman hammer or um, a plane that looked like that. And that's very true. These There's no attempt at um, historical authenticity for what exactly the type of tool St. Joseph is using. But the reason for that is, um, you know, I want this to be very clearly outside of time. And um, these are all tools that anyone can recognize today. And um, they each kind of have their their own beauty to them. Um, I hadn't thought about um, the spiritual significance of the types of tools, but I'd be interested to hear from you. I'm sure you've read so much, so many meditations on Saint Joseph. Is there some, I don't know, interpretation of um, what different tools could mean? Well, probably to each person would be different. For me, when I see the hammer, it reminds me that I need to hammer down my pride daily, hourly, by the minute. Um, because, you know, humility is the mother of all virtues. So pride is like, you know, the father of all vices, right? So we need to hammer down our pride. And then the saw, you know, we need to solve things that, you know, shouldn't be around in our life. Uh, and then with that plane, uh, you know, we need to like uh, get rid of the rough edges um you know so it, to me it's just kind of like a a very nice manly thing that kind of appeals to men i think um you know because a lot of times the spiritual life is presented too much kind of in an effeminate way and that's why i love your artwork usually it's like so, different flowers represent different yeah. that's virtues or something yeah, yeah. yeah well flowers are great but it's like you know when when saint joseph starts to look like he just had a manicure and he's got some lipstick on i don't like that um so i like the you know the the art that's very realistic and that's why i love your art because you're showing you know saint joseph as he was and um yeah i i just love it so i, I and i like the, the fact that yeah okay maybe the craftsman hammer you know didn't exist 2000 years ago it was obviously a little bit different but this to me kind of harkens to how uh you know he is a saint for our times as well and kind of calling us uh to do our part our work as well um so yeah that's that's kind of how i would see it yeah, and I will say that pretty much everyone who asks for a painting of St. Joseph today says, I want him to look very strong and virile and not a feminine or like an old man. Um, but I, I would say that um, I would be open to depicting St. Joseph as an old man or even a young boy or, um, you know, a young man. And, uh, you know, his uh, his his age is is perfectly fine to depict it at any point because I think he needs to be the example for all men um, Absolutely. Uh, but yeah maybe that 
um, that virility uh, should be translated no matter what age he's depicted at. And um, to depict like a very soft sort of sentimental St. Joseph, um, I don't think it's quite true to his his character. And I read a lot of uh, Venerable uh, Mary of Agreda in the mm -hmm. Mystical City of God um, when I was trying to kind of think about the source material for St. Joseph. She has very specific recommendations about, about what, what he might have looked like. Yeah, and she said he was 33 when he married Our Lady, which makes total sense theologically, historically, Jewish tradition-wise, and everything. It all makes sense. And even like, if you look at the Greek that St. Luke used, which happy belay St. Luke Day, a uh, patron of artists as well and iconographers, you know, he said that Joseph was a man, a nair, not a presbytes, old man. Uh, of course, he was an old man later when he died, like around age 60. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, that, that's a thing that I hope that St. Joseph, you know, with that hammer right there, uh, will build a bridge between the East and the West on this topic. Because in the East, many people think that St. Joseph was a grandfatherly aged man when he married, you know, the 15-year-old Virgin Mary. And, um, well, let me just try to have an open mind and say, well, that could be, but let's analyze the facts. Um, and at surface, it looks kind of creepy to me, uh, but more important, well, you know, I think it's it rooted. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think it's rooted in sort of this idea of wanting to preserve um, Our Lady's chastity. So so transparently, visually, when you see depiction of the Holy Family. But I almost think it's it's that much more um, beautiful if you do have her with a young man who is her guardian and we know that he is um, the the model of Joseph most pure. He is the most um, the most chaste man that was ever um, selected, of course, to to be Our Lady's protector. Yeah, you, you nailed it. No pun intended. But that was the original. I think probably good intention was to try to you know protect Our Lady's virginity by depicting Joseph in a older way uh, to make him chaste by senility rather than purity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, I think like you said, art is attractive, is the attractive power of truth. So when I look at art, I like to look at things that are true because when we contemplate the art, it helps us with our prayer. And to be honest, I never contemplate Our Lady with gray hair and looking old. You know, I contemplate her as she is. And you know, in heaven, I think St. Thomas Aquinas said that everyone looks like they're 33. So, um, you know, there's not going to be old men hobbling around in heaven, nor babies crawling around. Everyone's going to be in their prime, in their perfect age of, of life. Um, so, yeah, that's awesome. Well, that takes me to the next picture. Picture, I keep saying picture. The next uh, artwork here. So let me bring it up. And this picture I love. I only wish I knew about this piece of art when I did the book Journey with Joseph, because Joseph is clearly on a journey here. So please walk us through this art piece and tell us how it came about. Uh, well, this is a, a painting of, of St. Joseph on the flight into Egypt. And this is a painting I completed for um, the seminary of Mount St. Mary um, for one of their side altars. This is intended for, there's a, a painting of Our Lady that it's paired with, but it's intended to, to be a source of meditation for young men during their proprio dudic year and um, to sort of um, inspire them as they discern um, their vocation to the priesthood. And here I have St. Joseph looking quite serious, but um, he is also adorned in sort of um, an unusual way. You can see that he's wearing this very beautiful, like um, almost like a satin um, piece of clothing and um the the basket he's loaded down with all sorts of things and if you've ever seen a father carrying you know the stroller and the ba the backpack and to uh, the two-year-old you know you know that's just kind of father's roles is to carry everything um i wanted to transform this sort of uh spiritually to 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 show uh, the royal line that St. Joseph descended from. So his garments seem appropriate to someone of royal lineage. And then also too, all of his, his burdens are almost weightless as he walks. And um, so here, you know, his, um, his yoke is sweet, his burden is light. 
And um, in the far distance, there's just kind of these hints of um, of Egypt yeah. and uh, in particular, some of the, the lotus flowers there. That's awesome. Well, uh, my family and I, we lived in Egypt for a couple of years. And uh, yeah, I recognize it right away with the, uh, the palm trees there. Um, so I'm sure you probably ate some dates because uh, they have really good um, bala shakes there. They, the Arabic word for uh, date milkshakes, which are delicious. But uh, yeah, I love this. And I love how you have the green there and also the brown because, you know, historically, Joseph was initially depicted usually with brown. And I kind of wore my most St. Joseph-like shirt today. Uh, there's no collar and it's brown. Because I'm thinking that's kind of the, the color he probably wore. But somewhere along the line. Well, I'm, I'm wearing green to well, match yeah, the theme. <laughs> exactly. So, green, so Joseph is usually depicted with green or brown. And I don't know, but I have a theory that we can blame it on Ireland because you know the Irish like green and St. Patrick was green. So then they say, oh, just put green on St. Joseph too. Um, but historically the oldest images we have of St. Joseph uh, first were usually in white. Uh, like if you look at the uh, St. Mary Major Basilica in Rome, the most ancient icon showing Joseph at about age 33, as you said, uh, in a beautiful mosaic, um, he's in a white Roman tunic. And then later it shows him as in brown clothes. And then it was many, many years later, he developed his green wardrobe, uh, which I love as well, because I always see green. And it makes me think that, you know, we need to grow. Uh, and green is the, the color of the ordinary time. And St. Joseph is like the, the saint of the ordinary. He makes the ordinary extraordinary. So, uh, yeah, I, I love the color combination you've got going on in this on this artwork. Well, thank you. And so one, one other question, like, you know, as you have advanced degrees in physics and engineering, and, you know, as St. Joseph is, you know, not only a kind of like a hidden king, as you so eloquently mentioned, you know, he was also kind of like a, you know, like a tecton uh, engineer type where, you know, as you know, Jesus was basically building the new temple, you have Joseph in this long line of tecton kings that go back to King David and King Solomon. So like in that little, you know, carpenter's workshop, it's a lot of stuff profoundly going on. So, I mean, it was kind of like half engineering school and half seminary for Jesus. Um, I mean, it, it's quite profound. Like, you know, Joseph was teaching Jesus for, you know, some period of time, then slowly Jesus started teaching Joseph. Um, I, I just love that exchange, you know, between the, the man Joseph and the God man Jesus. So what would you add to that? Like with your background in engineering um, and physics, which, you know, go a lot into, you know, the, the artisan that St. Joseph and our Lord was, you know, in making things, does that kind of play into particularly your, your previous image in the, in the workshop? Um, I don't know. I always feel like, you know, sort of like St. Thomas Aquinas said when he finished his summa, he said, it's, it's just straw. He's going to burn it. <laughs> um, that's kind of how I feel about a lot of our earthly knowledge. And, um, I don't know. I think engineering, physics, right, right now, those fields are particularly highly respected and um, actually, I think it can be a temptation to remain in those fields because it's nice to have a, everybody impressed like, oh, you're an engineer, you study physics. But really, you know, I, I think something like um, uh, studying theology or um, advanced literary theory are so much more difficult and yet um, much less sort of valued in our world today. Um, right now, I'm most grateful for that formation in uh, the sciences um, because I homeschool our kids every morning, and it makes me so happy to be able to just give these tools to them, and um, you just don't know what they're going to do with it. So, um, you know, likewise, all of these hidden talents that we have within ourselves or abilities, God has placed there, and I just feel like we have this duty to develop them because we don't know what they're going to be used for. And, um, you know, at a younger age, I could tell, like, I could, I could do math. So why not study it and see what God wanted to do with it? And um, it ended up paying for um, teaching math, paid for my art education. And now I get to teach math, which is really fun to my own children. 
And then it also comes in handy on a lot of these kind of larger projects um, as far as now figuring out how will paintings fit into architectural spaces for larger and larger projects. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly. <laughs> um, you are, but... you are, and, and you, you hit on something that uh, keeps coming back to mind more and more lately. Uh, and it's something I told a friend recently, and that's that now I like to glory in how little that I know. Like, you know, someone said, the more I learn, the more I learn I don't know. And particularly yes. like in theology, I think it's just so, and particularly with this whole field of Josephology, like, we're like, wow, where's all this stuff been for like millennia? Like, we're just now figuring out this treasure who is St. Joseph. And I think it's kind of like a foretaste of heaven, like just eternity will have to figure things out and like, you know, new revelation upon new revelation where, um, you know, in this Valley of Tears, we very, at least me, sluggishly, slowly learn things. And it might take me almost a whole lifetime to have that aha moment. And, and then that's just not even the tip of the iceberg. Like you said, like, you know, St. Thomas, that was just straw. Like, you know, like for us, the summa is like, wow. And he's like, he had this glimpse of heaven that just made his summa like pale in comparison. So I think to me, that's just so exciting. Um, you know, like, and your art is showing that like, it's like a foretaste of what's to come. It's like a little, like a little keyhole into heaven. Like heaven is just so much beyond our imagination. Um, so to me, that's exciting. Well, and yeah, also too, I was just going to jump in and say that, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just an artist. I'm just, uh, I'm not a theologian. And so when I paint, I'm trying to read the works of people who've really meditated and know what they're talking about. And um, historically in the Middle Ages, sacred artists would have had theological advisors who would have told them exactly, okay, you need Our Lady here, you need to have... Um, these souls uh, falling into purgatory in the background, you know, it would have all been spelled out. And nowadays we're, we're running into a few problems because the artists are placed in a position where they are expected to um, come up with almost theories of, of, of theology um, that they're not formed to have. So um, if we can sort of reestablish all these distinct roles, um, you need a lot of different specialties coming together to create um, a tradition of really solid sacred art. Absolutely, absolutely. And I love the work that you're doing, bringing the uh, tradition of the Baroque and the Renaissance, you know, back to the forefront. Um, and some of your work's been featured in this new book, the Catholic Home Gallery, I understand. That's right. Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of paintings I did of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica. And those will always be among my favorites um, because they're in a, in a monastery over some side altars. Um, there's a lot of different fates that a painting can have, but the highest fate is uh, to uh, be placed over an altar and have mass celebrated in front of it every day. That is so cool. Well, you know, as some of the uh, Benedictine spirituality I've heard, you know, that's come out during the interview, um, have you by chance been to Benedictine College near Kansas City? Oh, that's on my on my high up on my list of places to visit. Um, I have not been there, but um, many people I know have said wonderful things about it. And I'm so happy to hear that they are um, growing their art program. So yes. there's another artist, James Patrick Reed, who I think is um, heading that up. And I, I just wish him mm -hmm. the very best because... We need another generation of artists. Well, it, it's a wonderful school. We have a couple of our sons going there, and I was there recently. Oh, they have some amazing artwork of St. Joseph there, some statues, some beautiful arts, particularly some beautiful art down in kind of the hidden chapel downstairs. So I encourage you, if you get a chance to visit, don't forget to check out the, the semi-hidden chapel downstairs uh, below their beautiful monastery. Um, Good. Yeah. And and since you're in St. Louis, I know that you're very involved with the pro-life movement. Uh, you're close to uh, Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser, right? That's right. So have you done the factory tour there? And if so, have you seen that uh, picture where it shows that, you know, that founder, he was like baby number 23 of their family? I don't think I've seen it, but I think I heard, I'm not sure if this is true, but I, I believe I heard that they financed... Um, the restoration of a beautiful shrine to Our Lady of Sorrows in Starkenburg, Missouri. And so that's that's always so edifying to see 
um, good work being done. Um, you know, a, a whole other vocation out there that I'd love to talk about sometime is that to being a patron of, of the arts. And I've met so many just wonderful people that are um, placing their resources kind of at God's disposal as far as making the world more beautiful. So. And, and, and I think that Augie Bush, you know, he made the world much more beautiful with Budweiser. And I think it's a great pro-life argument that like, you know, if it wasn't for that family having their 23rd child, we wouldn't have yeah. Bush beer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah, my wife and I, we went on a tour there one time in St. Louis of the, of the factory and it was really nice. Um, and I just thought that was so randomly cool that, you know, I saw this portrait on the wall with him, one of 23 children. It's like, wow, that's that's a little factoid that most people aren't aware of. But uh, Well, I think um, St. Catherine of Siena, wasn't she like 22 or something like that out of 24? I don't know. It was something crazy. But one of the greatest saints in the world, again, would never have existed if they had stopped with two. So Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and you have four of your four quivers uh, or four arrows in your quiver, I understand. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for saying yes. And also for your wonderful artwork. So for my closing question, um, let me just put it this way. You know, St. Joseph was always working and always dreaming. So what projects are you working on right now? And what are some dreams that you hope to fulfill? Um, I think the biggest dream right now is... Um in another 10 years or so, when I figure out how to paint, um, I would love to pass down some of those skills to others. And so I hope someday to be able to have a workshop where I can have a few um, young people that are seeking to kind of um, learn the craft of being a sacred artist. Um, and um, yeah, we'll see what God wants to do with that. Um, in the meantime, um, my daughter's middle name is Josephine. Oh, wow. Uh, so She's especially interested to St. Joseph, but I think our whole family is. And um, I just trust wherever wherever we're led is where we're supposed to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that is so cool. Well, uh, special shout out to your daughter, Josephine. That's such a cool name. We have a son named Joseph who was born in Egypt uh, on the Nile River, no less. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful, powerful name. May she increase indeed. And I thank you so much for your ministry that you and your husband and your children are helping with. And uh, I, I think it's so cool. One, one last parallel that I'd like to ask your opinion on is, you know, as we're sitting here in the workshop and you go every day to your studio, your, your workshop, your art workshop, I see a lot of parallels there between your family and the Holy Family. Does that come to your mind, you know, from day to day during your, your well. work? I don't know. I don't think there's a lot more spankings in our household than in the <laughs> Holy Family's household, but um, they're always the the ideal. So, um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully with their help, we'll, we'll get a little closer. Absolutely. And I think there's something so beautiful how, you know, all those hidden years in Nazareth uh, with, you know, Joseph's workshop there, uh, making the ordinary extraordinary uh, I think we sometimes forget about that like that boring time uh, particularly as Americans we look for the sensational but it was really those those 30 years you know hammering things out in Nazareth kind of behind the scenes um, something quite theological there that maybe your husband can write an article on yeah I'll, I'll let him know <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Gwyneth. I really appreciate it and uh, keep up the awesome work. And uh, I'd like to encourage everyone again to uh, get in contact with you if they'd like to have a, a piece of art commissioned. And uh, please, what's the best way they can get in contact with you? I think email is probably the best way. And there's a contact form on my website, GwynethThompsonBriggs.com. Um, and, uh, I'm always happy to make prints any size that you like for, of any of the paintings that you saw on the talk today. So wonderful. And I will link that down in the description below. And again, thank you so much. And as I like to always sign off, remind everyone to go to Joseph. Peace. Well, it's such a pleasure to, to meet you and to speak with you and, um, may St. Joseph bless you. Absolutely. Thank you. And you too. Take care and have thank a wonderful you. day.